Hi there, it's Kevin with RogueDeckBuilder.com here. This week's episode of the Market Monday. You heard that correctly. We are actually doing a Market Monday. Been on vacation in the Grand uh, Grand Prix Vegas and kind of got out of the swing of things, but back with some financial Market Monday video. So first of all, I just want to address the state of the market. I think that we are finally headed towards that bear market I was talking about at the start of the year. So I think that I was off on my prediction. Well, I absolutely was off on my prediction. I don't think that I was misreading the signals. I just didn't anticipate Dominaria to be such a hit because we saw a very sluggish Amike hour devastation, Ixalan arrives with Ixalan, started to see a downturn in the Magic the Avenue market as a whole. And then we had two really slam dunk sets of Unstable and Dominaria really hit the market. And I think it got people really spending money in Magic the Gathering, anywhere from even Legacy to Commander. I brought a lot of people back. The nostalgia of Dominaria brought some people back and the investment followed suit. However, we are in the dreaded summer months. And as usual, the summer months tend to have a sluggish market. And this seems to be uh, no different. I think that the hangover from Dominaria is real. Uh, people are spending less at my store, I've seen a lot less movement on like Cards Fair and other uh, markets as well. So even though we did have a record number at the Dominaria pre-release, summer months just come and, you know, most people are in the Northern Hemisphere and there's other things to be doing in the summer and Magic just takes a backseat. That should rebound and we'll have to see if we typically are in a downturn for Magic or if we are in an upturn once the fall comes back, once the uh, uh, return to return to return to Ravnica hits and then we can see the state of the market. So we'll talk about that more as time goes on. If you're looking to invest in staples for modern and commander, now is the time. Usually the summer month you, months you get a discount. It's funny. It used to be the discount you could get around Christmas time. Uh, that is no longer true. Christmas time seems to actually be a, a good little buying spree rather than a, a selling spree as people are now using magic cards as gifts. The summer months is where it's at. So if you're looking for those, you know, cryptic commands or uh, even any card across the board in Commander and Modern, there seems to be a discount in this uh, these sluggish days of summer. However, this video is not about the state of the market. This video is all about the M19 and opportunities surrounding uh, core set Magic 19 returning to the core sets and some cards that are going to be affected both in modern and standard. We're not going to really focus too much on commander uh, for this particular video other than I do think that looking at legendary creatures for commander specifically, if you can hit that Nahab the Eternal or the Locust God or uh, what's the ones out of Dominaria, the Slimefoot, uh, what was the Hepatra, those type of cards, if you can get ahead of all the staples that go in those particular commanders, you can usually do double ups, triple ups, quadruple ups in a short period of time. So again, we're not going to focus on that for this particular video. Maybe we'll skim, skim over a few. I'm not quite sure what's going to be the popular commander out the gate. I think there might be a little bit of a hangover from Dominaria as far as commanders are concerned because we just came from a set that had so many commanders that people probably have enough new commanders that I don't know if th this is going to affect a lot of people building uh, a brand new uh, toy for commander. All right, so let's just get started with first the banned and restricted. So this is the first thing I want to talk about because I believe that July 2nd, the ban list announcement is going to have some unbannings. Uh, first of all, in modern, and I wouldn't be surprised if there's some bannings and unbannings in standard as well, as I think a lot of cards that are on the ban list for standard are ir irrelevant, especially since we have some numbers from Arena of a particular card called Rampaging Frostodon that didn't actually see a lot of play in the arena format and I don't think it would be that big of an issue at the moment in standard I think that both Rampaging Frostodon and to an extent the uh, Rogue Refiner were uh, banned alongside the real culprits being the Ramen Up Ruins as well as the Attune With Aether and they just want to make sure that that deck didn't stay those two decks didn't stay dominant uh, which is only banning one card. So that's why they did the double bans for those particular archetypes. However, I think that both are probably safe to unban because I don't know if it would push energy back into the mix, especially we, we have two strategies that are very good at dealing with energy, both the very aggressive uh, red decks as well as the uh, heavy controlling uh, uh, Teferi decks are, are traditionally good uh, versus the energy type strategies. However, uh, again, I don't know if, if those will come off the ban list. I don't. I wouldn't put my you know my money where my mouth is on those. Uh, people are talking about the Chain Whirler getting a ban. In fact, the market has adjusted on MTGO. MTGO is usually a little bit ahead 
of the curve or of the trends with paper as the market's easy to the buying and selling happens instantaneously rather than waiting for cards being shipped and 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 fees collected and that sort of thing everything happens almost instantaneous with uh MTGO so you can tell that this this might not be anything too concerning you can tell that this has been going down uh, since the, I mean, since it hit the peak here for Dominaria, this is across the board for Dominaria and MT Joe. This is just how things happen. Rares tend to not hold any value out of a set that is open as much as Dominaria, no matter how played the rare is. Uh, it's this isn't surprising. We saw this with like Scrappy Scrounger. We've seen this with other first set rares are very very tough to hold value um, out of on MT Joe. It's just the mythics, and then after after the sets get out of their draft phase is where they actually hold some sort of value. So this isn't to me too concerning about Chain World. However, I have heard around the, the the murmurings around the community that this card is going to get a ban. So I think if Goblin Chain World does get a ban though, they could easily take off Rampaging Frost on. Now I was part of Arena a little bit later than a lot of people, but I was still before Ixalan and Dominaria when I started playing Arena. And Red was one of the most played decks on Arena and Rampaging Frost on was legal and barely any, anybody actually even used it. So it was more relegated toward the sideboard a lot of the time. It was only right before the bannings where they started putting the Rampaging Frosted on in the, uh, in the main. And it was more of a, a cyber card to kind of hose the token base or live gain strategy. So I could see Rampaging Frosted on coming off the ban list and being replaced by Goblin Chain Whirler. I could see them not wanting to ban Goblin Chain Whirler because I don't know if Standard can go through another banning. However, if one card does need to be banned, it probably is the Chain Whirl. I think it's the most oppressive card right now in Standard. And I think we've had enough finishes even post Pro Tour. Uh, I think the last Grand Prix, was it, what was it, Grand Prix Pittsburgh? No, where's the last Grand Prix at? Uh, last weekend uh, was won by another Mono Red, and there was a bunch of the Black Reds running the Goblin Chain Whirler in the list. So it's still kind of a problem card at the moment, and I wouldn't be surprised if it did, does get the uh the axe so first of all what are the banned cards right now in standard we have aetherix marvel smugglers copier felidar guardian attune with aether rogue refiner rampaging frost on ramen up ruins i don't see ramen up ruins coming off the ban list as as red decks are dominant i can see rampaging frost on being basically uh flipped for the chain whirler as again we didn't see a lot of arena play with the rampaging frost on it's a relevant dinosaur type i mean goblins is a relevant type too they want to do tribal but i think that you know ixalan needs the time to shine maybe they throw this back in rogue refiner and a tooth aether probably will still stay banned as well as either aether X marvel didn't have a lot of cards to really abuse with but i think with the printing of omniscience i don't think that's safe to unban aether X marvel uh, for omniscience that's just begging for decks to go crazy uh the smuggler's copter isn't in my opinion, would be a card that's okay to come off the ban list because we have cards like Fatal Push. We have cast, or, or, or we have the cast away, cast out. What's the 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 destroy target non legendary creature? I, it slipped my mind here. Uh, for two mana, one in a, a black. We have like lightning strikes. We have a lot of ways to deal with Smuggler's Copter, the a braid that didn't exist when it was deemed unworthy for standard and banned. However, it's just one of those cards which go in too many decks, and we've gone through that phase where Smuggler's Copter hit like 75, 80 percent of decks. I don't think they want to go back through it. Felder Guardian is not going to see the time of day, in my opinion, without the i mean with the, the infinite combo in standard at the moment uh with sahili and so i think that again it's standard isn't where we really want to look at for an investment for unbannings modern however there have been some articles written recently on tcg player as well as i believe on some of the other big sites uh there was a no ban list modern that was played and there are a, a bunch a bunch of cards that didn't even see any sort of play or dismal play at that uh that are on the ban list and are probably safe to come off. And there's two mentioned specifically. And I, I am thinking that the Jason Mind Sculptor and the uh, the Bloodbraid Elf are a huge sign of this, this ban list. So they want to take more cards off of this rather than put cards on it. So the two cards that are definitely in discussions, the first one being Birthing Pod. Birthing Pod has a lot of other culprits right now. Talk about a Braid. A Braid's a, a decent little card that can start be put in people's decks to take care of the Birthing Pod. Now, Birthing Pod might just be a lot better than like the counters company to assembling that combo. Uh, so for that reason, I'm, I'm thinking Birthing Pod is the less safe out of the, the other card that I think is going to be unbanned. And we'll talk about in that in a minute. So again, Birthing Pod has a lot more hate though uh, to take care of it 
than it did when it was banned. And it was a different, Modern was a different beast back then. It was a really grindy value-based format. You know, Splinter Twins, Birthing Pods, those were the uh, taking over the, the format at the time. Uh, we have a much more aggressive Modern. I mean, a lot of sets have come out. A lot of archetypes have uh, been able to become legitimate archetypes like humans, like Hollow One, uh, that Birthing Pod might not even be able to compete with uh, at this point. It might just be too slow. Uh, Birthing Pod was was banned because it really it was Seed Rhino that, that put Birthing Pod over the top. And now we're not even seeing Seed Rhino see much play in modern. Uh, they're in a few abs and decks. Every now and then you'll see one. So Birthing Pod is in the discussion for being unbanned. Personally, I think it's safe to be a, being unbanned. There's enough degenerate things. There's a lot of easy ways to already assemble the combos in in uh, modern. And Birthing Pod is just another tool to, to um, get that done. And the other card, though, the card that I do think is going to get an unbanning and already has a very, very high price tag right now is the Stoneforge Mystic. I think Stoneforge Mystic is very clunky and slow and kind of weird for modern at the time. I think that Batter Skull is just a... Again, when it gets Colgan's Command, when it gets ripped out after they go in and tutor for it, if it just doesn't end up putting out a 4-4 a that doesn't really have much value at that point to stopping a combo to even i mean it's good versus like burn and burn burn is is still doing well though i mean a lot of times burn can outrace this or just not even worry about a batter skull coming out when they can use cards like destructive reverly so the the stoneforge mystic i think is very very safe to come off it could breathe a lot of new life into these more grindy white mid-range or even control uh, and they already have a lot of other routes that those particular decks can go. I mean, this, this feels like Snapcaster Mage is just much better for a format, uh, modern format than, than Stoneforge Mystic would be. This is a problem card, though, because it does hamper des design space going forward if they print the equipments that are very, very powerful. Of course, of course, the Stoneforge Mystic can break them. So it'll always be on the back of the designer's heads of creating like a six or seven or eight mana equipment that has a low equip cost because of something like Stoneforge Mystic that can really break. It. I, however, think that Jason Mindsculptor and Bloodbred Elf are going to be are, are huge signals that they're wanting to take cards as many cards possible off of the ban list. And Stoneforge Mystic to me is the most fair card left on the ban list. The other one, of course, is Splinter Twin, but a lot of people are still wanting Splinter Twin unbanned. However, I, I don't think it's quite there yet. I think that Splinter Twin may see. Uh, the time in the sun one more time for standard. It could be like a Golgari grave or for modern. It, might, uh, it could be like Golgari grave troll. They take it off and then it gets banned again if it's too oppressive. However, I think that Splinter Twin uh, is easily fair enough for the modern format at the moment, which is crazy to say. The rest of these though are, are rightly probably banned. There's a lot of cards on this list that have either warped or will warp modern. And, and yeah, so that'd be, so let's just check the Stoneforge Mystic here. Stoneforge Mystic already see, seems like the other people are on that, that mind frame. It's gone up to its highest price. One of the reasons though, that this has actually gone up is this used to exist in a, what's called a theme deck set in, uh, on MT Joe. So whenever this card would get ab about above, I believe around like four tickets, if it ever got above, yeah, you can see that no, it looks like 2.5, three tickets it was actually worth it to buy the theme deck and then just sell the Stoneforge Mystics to the bots. So there's usually enough stuff in the theme deck set. Let's just check it out to see what kind of the stuff that we're on here. Uh, there, there's an Aether Vial in there and a Stoneforge Mystic, I believe in the same, in the same um, deck. And so whenever those became valuable enough that people would just buy the theme decks and then, and then sell them away. However, they discontinued the theme deck and now the, the Stoneforge Mystic has started to go up. You can see this, the trending up, 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 up. And, but this last one does seem to see be that people are expecting this to be unbanned in modern. Now, again, it does see play in legacy, but the, the, the cards that it goes and grabs in legacy, the JIT, is banned. That's the JIT is a huge, huge uh, reason to why Stoneforge Mystic is so good. Is this card is just a the definition of a grindy card. It can actually win the game quite quickly, and it makes all of your little things threats. So even something like a Mother of Runes becomes a huge threat with it with it with the JIT. So the other card that does get the sort of, of fire and ice is particularly good for the protection from blue and protection from red in Legacy. It it, it follows suit. It'd be extremely good. Uh, sort of fire and ice. 
in modern, but I mean, you can hard cast it already in modern and no one really wants to play sort of fire and ice because it's just a liability, uh, for cards like the Colgan's command, or it's just easy to, you know, in response to an equip, kill it. And modern is very merciful, merciless. Like it's a lot easier to, con- to make sure that your threats af- actually stick and to be able to control the uh, removal in legacy than it is in modern. And that's why, you know, these, these sort of death and taxes type strategies, try to try to take care of all the lands. So your opponents can actually cast something so that you could actually hook up a sword. Uh, whereas in modern, that's not so easy to do. So I don't like like comparing it to, Oh, look how much it, it sees play in legacy is as actually relevant towards uh, comparing it to modern because they are whole different ball games uh, with how the tempo works in legacy and just, just really how, uh, punishing modern is if you you know stumble on even a turn. So I think the Stoneforge Mystic and a Sword of Fire and Ice will be perfectly acceptable. Stoneforge Mystic and a Batter School would be perfectly acceptable. What's not acceptable, of course, is Stoneforge Mystic in, into the the JIT, and that's still banned. So yeah, it's I think that we're in a we're in an okay place to experiment with Stoneforge Mystic. Uh, getting unbanned. I mean, even Bloodbred Elf is a, is an actual check. Bloodbred Elf in a Colgan's command for like even a Stoneforge Mystic type play. I mean, by the time you get it out on turn three or uh, turn four, you're getting the 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 Bloodbred Elf out to to kill the artifact and you know kill the Stoneforge Mystic at that point. So anyway, that is that. Um, Birthing Pod also seems to be trending up. This is probably more to do with EDH uh, commander than anything. It's been trending up for quite some time. Still sees a heavy bit of play in the green black decks, the recursion decks with, uh, is it Marin? Uh, the commander deck, which is one of the, I believe the second most played uh, next to Atraxa. And so of course, being the second most popular uh, commander deck is going to outstretch the supply of cards like this, and it definitely wants to be in every one of those decks, uh, as it's both a sack outlet and a tutor. So you can see that that's why it's been going up for quite some time. However, recently it looks like it's starting to trend up again on on uh, MT Joe, which could mean that people are anticipating uh, an unbanning. So that's what I, all I have to say about the unbanning topic. I know that was a long winded uh, topic for this market Monday. So let's just go over to Corset 2019. Corset 2019 is very interesting. This is what I consider a utility set more than a uh, defining set. So I would say that like Ixalan, of course, Kaladesh are what we consider the defining sets. They're they're the ones that are going to bring out the archetypes that are going to be um, the things that are you're going to see in standard. So of course the artifact and energy thing from Kaladesh, we saw s- somewhat of a graveyard based theme and a very aggressive red and aggressive controlling theme from the Amonkhet blocks. And from Dominera, we see a little bit of a tribal Ixalan as well um, with those type of themes with like Knights and Merfolk and, and, and whatnot. Uh, Core 19 doesn't really have a lot of, like it's missing a lot of pieces of course to be a defining set. It has a lot of utility or supplemental cards that will help other existing themes. And there's some goodies scattered throughout the core set 2019, where I, I, I think it's too early to tell how these really impact standard. What core set is better to look at is some of these cards that are going to affect modern. And we'll go over those in a second. So let's just go over the prices right now. These are the pre-sale prices. It's funny that the most expensive card out of the set is the buy a box promo. Uh, typically it's six mana, take extra turns at C play, but this is one of the few, is this the only one besides Gonti's Aether Heart, I believe, in standard at the moment? And typically there's always a deck that runs Nexus of Fate. So this is really, I, this might uh, cause some outrage if this is a four of in a, uh, like a deck that just wants to grind up. This is another reason Aetherworks Marvel probably should not be unbanned as a card like Nexus of Fate and then Omniscience in the same, uh, in the same sort of strategy would just be busted. I mean, if you thought that the, uh, the Ulamog and Emrakul was bad, just think about Nexus, Nexus of Fate and Omniscience. I know it's kind of weird off, uh, if just taking an extra turn using energy, but still that's something you can hit off the marble. Um, anyway, so next to fate though, with omniscience, y- you think there's going to be some standard decks out there. You still have cards like, like borrow, uh, to have those heavy control based decks to just, just grind out the game until you can take, take extra turns, then cast everything. This is, is my, this, this is going to cause some outrage. If this is, this sees plays even a two of or a three of or a four of in a even semi-popular standard, 
uh, deck. So if you can utilize your buy a box from your local game store, I highly, highly suggest that you do. Typically, tech extra turns to go in a lot of different commander decks. This seems to be one of the weaker ones. That's probably why they weren't too worried about putting it as a buy box promo. Uh, typically, buy box promos, if you look at the Su- Sunspeaker, they, they do go down from their early pre-sale price because there are a lot more of these out there than people actually realize. However, the difference between Nexus of Fate and Sunspeaker is this, again, this is inevitably going to see play in some sort of standard deck, whether it be even a tier three deck, this is going to see play. So Nexus of Fate, the sky's the limit of where this can actually go, depending on the supply of these buy box promos. Usually game stores get a substantial amount, but that still pales in comparison to amount of booster boxes that are sold, and these run out very, very quickly. So again, this this might this might cause some outrage in the Magic community with these Nexus of Fates being very very tough to uh, to come across. All right, so Nickel Nickel Bull the Ravager I think is a and we'll probably do a video. I'll do my typical booms and busts. Didn't call some some very good calls on Dominaria. I think I was I fell flat on all the cards I thought was going to go up, and some of the cards I thought were going to go down actually uh, maintained their price for quite some time. I think they're all down to where their pre-sale prices are now, like History Benali and Karn. All those are starting to flatline out uh, to their pre pre-sale price or a uh, pre sell prices of of where I predicted them at. But anyway, I digress on that. Nickel Bull Ravager, I think, is is kind of overinflated at the moment. This is hard to go. It has to go in a tier one deck to maintain this price. And it must maintain it there for quite some time. Right now, Grixis is is really lacking. And I don't know if Nickel Bullis really gives Grixis the push. Uh, to have it compete with what the other strategies are doing at the moment. Uh, the ETB effect on Nickel Bullis is actually quite lackluster compared to some other ETB effects uh, as a four drop. Uh, even if this this said there's a battlefield draw a card, that'd be, in my opinion, more significant than opponent discarding cards because how many times is their opponent, even on turn four, still going to have a dead card they don't care about? At that point, they can just discard uh, comparison. If you were able to draw a card, I think that'd be much more backbreaking. The uh, seven mana to have this card actually stick around until you have seven mana is also something that might be a lot more tough uh, to accomplish. So I'm not liking the pre-sale price at the $27 uh, for Nickel Bullis. You can see Crucible Worlds and even cards like Omniscience and Scapeshift for all getting crushed. This is just because they're all, this is value packed. These are the ones that are going to hold the value of the set. And this is also a reason why I think that the, the vast majority of cards in the set are not going to be able to hold value uh, just because we know that these staples, uh, even though they are reprints, are going to hold a lot of value. If you can see like the price trajectory of an Omniscience, if you look at some of these old, uh, Omniscience got a reprint in, okay, it's first printing actually is in M13. You can see that it just goes up, 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 up. And uh, a second reprint of this, I don't think is going to, you know, kill the price of Omniscience is going to rebound quite quickly. The $10 pre- pre-sale price for Omniscience is actually uh, pretty fair. Uh, to invest in right now and, and then recoup it. I, I expect this to get back to the $15 mark uh, quite soon, just how much it does see play in a, a lot of various formats and a very casual favorite uh, card. So Crucible, same thing. Crucible, if we look at the price trajectory of some of these older sets, it this is going to be, if you count the invention, it's going to be the fourth printing. It even had some promos here and there. This card just continues to go up uh, as time went on. Just, this was a very, very sought after card hit all the way to the $75 mark. I mean, I think it's flatlined out around here, but this was, this was kind of the great fall of magic at Oath the Gatewatch. This was kind of the peak of magic prices. And so Crucible Worlds is a good example of, of where we've been kind of plateaued with Magic the Gathering. And especially when a card gets this valuable too, it's hard to find buyers. People will just like, oh, I really want it for my uh, whatever deck or the grit or the, the, the Pepe, uh, what's the frog out of Shadows of Innistrad? um deck but i don't want to pay you know 70, 75 bucks for it and then you have to find the buyers for these particular uh cards so anyway uh crucible though i think is still a little bit i think that 20 27 man that's actually very reasonable uh for a card like this that will probably hold around the 15 to 20 dollar mark and then after this set is done being opened we'll start going back up we have a lot of unknowns with this set too like the tezzeret Art- artifice master there's been a lot of people that have been talking about how this is the best planeswalker printed in a long time i think five for a five loyalty planeswalker is a little bit steep at this point the plus one is pretty lackluster it's the zero that everyone likes where you draw a card if you control three or more artifacts you draw two cards yeah that seems pretty busted if you can activate it twice we'll have to wait and see though it is directly 
uh, competing with Teferi where the untapping two lands might just be better than not having to build around artifacts. And of course, you'll have to be in white at that point. So yeah, and we're, we're still at the end of Kaladesh where we have a lot of cards that can actually work really well with the Tezzeret Artifice Master. However, I think this is a big unknown and it's too rich for my blood to really be in investing in it. The card I hate the most is this Resplendent Angel. I think this is a trap. Uh, we still have Fatal Push in the format. We still have... Uh, what is it? Cast Down. I think that's the card that I keep thinking of. We still have Cast Down. This has no ATB effect. This this reminds me of what's the vampire out of Battle for Zendikar that everyone spent a, a, an arm and a leg on in the pre-sale uh, that had first strike and then gave plus one plus one counter to each creature uh, once it dealt combat damage. The Respondent Angel, you have to gain five life. Do people understand how difficult that is in standard right now to really set it up? And if you don't have Respondent Angel and you have an effect that does gain five life, ugh, ugh. I mean, I know it does have the synergy with Lyra. However, you still have to deal that one extra damage. Uh, when Lyra will come out and give this plus one plus one, it will deal four damage. You'll have to have some other way to gain life at that point. Uh, to me, it's just Resplendent Angel is one of those cards that looks good when it first comes out. And it's just going to be very, very tough uh, to justify throwing this in the deck when it's directly competing with cards like History Penale that lose back uh, two bodies and they actually become bigger. Uh, and... There are actually some other synergies with the enchantment where you can recur it. Uh, whereas Respendent Angel, I think, is just really, really tough to uh, get that 4-4 Angel token afterwards. I, I can't. It's it's each end step. You start getting Flying Vigilance, Lifelink. I get it. You get a lot of uh, Angel tokens. But we look at Crested Sunmare. We look at a bunch of these other cards. And it's it's tough. It's really, really tough to to make these type of effects work. And these others, a lot of these other planeswalkers I've already talked about in, in my spoiler video. And same thing as Zelda Dragons being the three colors. That's pretty uh, right there is very restrictive uh, to what decks they can go into. And again, this this core M19 is, in my opinion, the value is going to be held in the reprints because those are the known factors. And they're going to push a lot of these cards down in price. And there are a lot of other utility cards or sideboard cards for like modern that are going to be the real winners out of this set. So I do like the corn uh, 2019 long term. There will be a lot of cards like rest in peace type cards if they do see cyborg plays uh, that will have the ability to after it's been drafted for a long period of time or post rotation. We'll have some investable opportunities. However, right out of, out of the gates with cards like Omniscience, Crucible Worlds and whatnot, I, this set is very, very tough to invest in, especially at these pre-sale prices. There are some other interesting things from M19. We have some playables in these Planeswalker decks, which is kind of crazy because usually Planeswalker decks were not supposed to have any cards that will affect standard play because they want cards that are going to be played in standard in uh, booster packs. Otherwise, the price can, you know, how you can have this runaway price because they're only offered in these uh, supplemental products. And there was stuff like Aggressive Mammoth that didn't actually seem too terrible to throw in a you know, a Stompy deck. This is six mana for an 8-8 eight, eight to give all other creatures you control a trample. I mean, it's kind of like Ronus's ability to give something plus two plus zero and trample. That's one of the things green, a lot of these cards in green absolutely want trample as it is kind of to get just blocked by a 1-1. One, one. And aggressive mammoth, mammoth actually occurs pretty well with some of these five drops and four drops. And it's, to me, this body isn't actually an 8-8 eight, eight for, for, for six or for six mana, that's not bad. I know we're in the the, the realm of like Gishath and and Verder's Gearhulk and which Verder's Gearhulk right there is an eight eight if you put the counters on itself. Uh, but again, other creatures you control have trample. This is very interesting, and I believe this is only yeah this is only in the Planeswalker deck. So there's some interesting little inclusions. I there was another one here too that I saw uh, that was only in a, a a Planeswalker deck. I'm like, man, that's actually close to seeing play in. Uh, standard. So there, the, the mythic that is most interesting to me though is the Bone Dragon. Bone Dragon I think is 5 mana for a 5-4. I know you have to exile 7 other cards from your graveyard but if we get into like a very grindy format where, I mean this just pales in comparison of, uh, to Ash Cloud Phoenix. Doesn't even block Ash Cloud Phoenix very well. It does have one more power and one more toughness. However, it doesn't have haste and it's harder to recur. However, this, this could be a grindy card that I could see play uh, typically, these type of cards in the past in certain standard formats have seen play. Doesn't got, doesn't got a glory bringer either, by the way. But again, this is this is eh, probably probably too much wishful thinking on that point. But this is this is an interesting card here. 
All righty. So the, the one thing that we do get though, now going off to modern is you can come over here to MTG goldfish and, and check out the article by Seth that talks about the, there's like 10 cards he picks for, uh, potential hate cards for modern. I think that's a pretty good article to go over. Again, just come over to MG Goldfish and read it over. And most of those are still like the sun cleansers in there. I think these are a little bit too rich for how much they'll end up settling off. Like even cards, uh, think of cards like Howled Moonlight, even cards like Rest in Peace or Stony Silence. When they're in their draftable set, they have a hard time actually holding any sort of, like under $2 is where they, they usually... Uh, flatline out at and they don't don't start getting value until after like a year or two late years later when people forget about them in bulk bins and then the the modern decks actually the the sideboard modern decks uh start to actually outstretch the supply and people and the price falls suit so that's where i think a lot of these are going to end up and again just go check out that article i don't know if any of them of course at pre-sale price are investable uh, there is some cool little tribal cards, and that's the next thing I want to talk about, is usually when you're looking at a set, you want to find the potential cards that could go up to, because of cards coming out in a new set. So there are three real tribes, I would say, that that goblins, I think, was pretty eh. The goblin lord here. I, I don't think any goblins really gets pushed by any card out of this particular set. Again, you can think you can somewhat think the angels is a tri the tribe for white, but for the black, you have the zombies. The zombies actually gets a lot of, of love from the death baron. We have another lord, so we're gonna have two lords. Uh, if you count Liliana's mastery, death baron, uh, death baron Liliana mastery, and the lord from Lord of the Accursed, that zombies actually seem like they might be able to compete in standard at the moment i know that they they lost a lot of things from shadows industry of course has a huge zombie feel to it but amiket was a big zombie block as well and there are a lot of pieces now we have another one drop we have the comes and play tap two two zombie uh so zombies can actually come out very, swinging pretty hard and then you have the lords to back them up most of the lords have uh, like this one gives actual death touch and plus plus one. The other one will give menace and plus one plus one. And Luna's mastery creates more zombies and gives plus one plus one. So I think that the, all of the the makings for a zombie tribal are there. If that sort of tribals can compete, like Merfolk typically has is doing what zombies used to do, and Merfolk right now is is tough to play in standard just because of the the two extremes the heavy heavy control on one end and the super fast either vehicle or just red based aggro strategies have kept merfolk down merfolk is a pretty decent strategy if you again if you played arena uh before kaladesh or dominaria it was a legit deck that you could actually have success with so post rotation merfolk might come back into the mix and pre-rotation though zombies might might see some play, but it also might have the same problem that, that Merfolk or dinosaurs or, or pirates or, or a lot of the tribals are having right now uh, with the two extremes of trying to compete in a form in, in a, a very polarized format of heavy control or, or in incredibly fast aggro decks. So, but you do get some good zombies, like I said. You get also the two drop, the great the graveyard marshal, uh, which is a two mana for a three two and then does have the ability to exile creature card from your graveyard to create a two two black zombie creature token. What's really cool about the graveyard marshal is if you have nothing better to do you can just use the three mana and you can use this multiple times per turn um to any zombie that doesn't have any recursion uh you can then just exile it and get a two two and and a three mana is, isn't that rough to do so and it's another zombie and will get pumped up by your lords it rinse and repeat it can come back from board wipes you know kind of feels like a scrap heat scrounger type ability uh to to keep on going so green gets Green gets elves. Elves gets a, a couple of two drops. You have the elvish clan caller and a few of the elves that. Well, let's 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 back up here. So graveyard marshal. You could look into like Liliana's mastery. I don't think there's enough time though for Liliana's mastery to go up. Uh, there is also the one drop out of Amonkhet, the two one that you can bring back for three mana. Um, and there are a few other decent little targets. Uh, a couple of the li like Liliana out of Amonkhet maybe could go in a deck like that. Uh, however, again, most of these are, are rotating. And so I don't like sinking any money in a card cards that are rotating at this point in time. Uh, modern people have been talking about how this adds another two uh, converted mana cost, double black for Great Merchant of Asphodel type deck. So now we have the messenger. We have two, two, uh, two, 
pretty decent zombies for there's this one now and then the the one out of Indus, uh, Shadow of Innistrad that when it dies you can pay mana to bring back another zombie. So it, mono black devotion zombies could be a thing maybe. Uh, again, you have Grey Merchant, you have Messenger, you have a lot of decent little one drops, two drops, nice little curve uh, for Modern. However, Modern is just again another uh, whole other animal at this point where you have to be incredibly degenerate or good at taking care of degenerate type strategies to actually uh, see competitive play. The Elves are a little bit more interesting. Elvish Clan Caller gives a two mana tribe. I think that this might want to see play in a lot of the elves. I mean, the Dwinian's Elite is where this really shines with. I know that they don't curve correctly. I mean, you're saying, okay, well, Arch Druid is just better at that point at one, two, three. However, two mana and elves versus three mana is where on turn four, you can cast two, two mana. You can't cast two, three mana spells. And so a clan caller at that point might be something else wants. It's also a mana dump in a way. Uh, you don't have to tap it though, but six mana and tap, you go get another copy for it. And so again, with the Dwinian's Leaf and other ways to create a bunch of uh, tokens, Elvish, Elvish visionaries that just replace themselves, uh, they become two, two threats rather than just one ones. Yeah, I can see this actually seeing play. Standard, this does get kind of interesting. You do lose a lot of the elves from Kaladesh. Uh, Kaladesh was a heavy elf theme set. Uh, cards like Rishkar, of course, will hurt. Uh, however, you still have the, what is it, Maverin from Dominaria. You have Llanowar Elves from Dominaria. There's there's quite a few elves from Dominaria. Uh, that, And we're going back to Ravnica, which does have a lot of elves. So this, picking up like Maverins might be a smart move. I just think that Dominaria is going to be so open that any rare and below in Dominaria is just completely uninvestable at this time period. And it's going to take quite a, uh, a long time for them to go up as uh, that's the the problem when you have two forty dollar plus mythics in a set, it just gets open, 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 open. Uh, however, elves do, does seem pretty interesting, and and this this even like I said, elves in modern, uh, like the either the collected company version or just the regular lead the stampede version. This gets kind of interesting for the elvish clan caller. Um, anyway, the other one that I really really talk about, which I think is the 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 best at least for investable targets, is going to be surrounding the Supreme Phantom. Uh, Supreme Phantom is a lord now for spirits. So spirits now have two lords. They have one that gives them hexproof and plus one plus one, and now two mana. And they actually curve quite nicely together. This also has flying. We have a bunch of one-drop spirits uh, that go uh, you know, synergize quite well with the Supreme Phantom. Uh, the this the Aether Vial seems to work quite well also with spirits because a lot of them do either... You either want to flood your board as quickly as possible with spirits. I mean, Collected Company 2 is another route you can go with spirits. And the you have a lot of utility spirits too. Uh, you have a Hexproof one with Geist of St. Trap. This makes Geist of 3-3. Three, three. Ma makes it so it actually does survive Pyroclasm if, if people start to bring back Pyroclasm as a way to take care of Geist. I know that there was a... Uh, when I used to take care of Geist, it was the the instant can't be countered to damage. What is that? Volcanic Fallout. Uh, and now Supreme Phantom can get Geist above and also survive the volcanic fallout as it's a 1-3, which I think is very relevant. So there are many other ways you can go with spirits, like a bunch of tokens actually produce, uh, or a bunch of, of, of spells actually produce tokens, like Spectral Processions and Lingering Souls, of course. And this just makes, you know, t uh, four two twos rather than uh, intangible virtue used to be the way that the route that they go but you might think that maybe supreme phantom they can effective you know throwing a spell caller in the deck or a, a, a droxical captain might be a better route to go i think that the supreme phantom is the most likely card to actually breathe new life in a already semi-competitive you see it every now and again bant spirits you see esper spirits every now and again uh you you i think that this is this is a a good inclusion towards those particular uh cards or, or for those decks and, and can actually increase the value of those particular cards, which is a good sign because spell Queller is a card that I invested all out and on MT Joe and it finally got a $2 raise. We'll look at that in a second. This is a long market Monday. Uh, but anyway, Supreme Phantom though, is I think that the, the best, the best card for, from M19 for really breathing new life in, you know, older cards. We just got out of a spirit set of uh, Shadow of Rindestrad and eldritch moon they had a lot of spirit it seems to be a very evergreen tribe or whatever you want to call it every set has spirits in it and there's uh, there's a the remorseful spirit too or most remorseful cleric that is a really good inclusion 
in the the spirit type decks to, to kind of hose a lot of the either dredge or hollow one or uh even works versus storm to a point uh, actually does works very well versus storm uh to just one shot get rid of the graveyard and, and make storm kind of have to reset at that point you have to time it perfectly but i, I think it's 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 something that it might actually be even main boardable in modern if not it's a great thing to throw into sideboard i think the spirits just is starting to look very similar to humans what i mean by that is it has a lot of the the makings for a utility like all the utility cards and then they become bigger and bigger and bigger with the two lords uh all the all spirits needs is maybe like no i think that i think it's it's good to go you have something that counter spells at a one drop uh you have ones that give hexproof at a two drop indestructible at a two drop you now have a lord at a two drop you have a, a very good lord at a three drop uh then if you paired with a good old phantasmal image you can clone it and then everything has hexproof and they get bigger and bigger and bigger i think spirits is the real deal and i think this is these two cards definitely are going to put it back into contention for modern uh, so again, a few other cards I want to talk about the sun cleanser, uh, again, saffron olives is the, is his article is definitely the way to go, uh, for these, these, these hate cards. I don't, I'm not sure if any of the hate cards, uh, the one I like the most is the infernal reckoning. I think that this card is actually going to see play right out the, 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 the gates in standard. I think that even though fatal push kills most of the cards, that uh you are already having a problem with like the the scrap heat scrounger and the heart of cran infernal reckoning gets rid of scrap heat forever it's gone it exiles that you gain through life and that's insanely relevant when people are running like ss extraction uh to gain that life i think infernal reckoning is just much better it doesn't hit like chain whirlers of course but it does hit the, the cards in those particular decks that are problematic and you never know when you actually do come across some some of these other cards in standard we've seen metalwork colossus c play from time to time uh traxos if traxos has ever had a chance of seeing play infernal reckoning is going to really punish that uh gaining seven life does not seem too terrible and then in modern taking care of thought not seers even reality smashers the cost of a card uh, and gaining five life is exactly what you want to be doing uh versus that particular deck because those are aggro based strategies and the xl is is can be relevant in some of those particular strategies is there there tends to be uh speaking of eldrazi uh that wants to die there's another one out of the the three two when it dies and then it it tries to replace itself there's there's a lot of of cards i think infernal reckoning does very well well against so this is the card i like the most uh as particular hate cards of of retaining value and actually maybe even going up from the three dollars and 35 uh cent mark so anyway last but not least let's just go ahead and look at spirits so right now, Empty Joe's already adjusted. So you can see that Spellcore is on the move. And if we, we look over here at the Bant, there's Bant Nightfall and Bant Spirits that, well, Bant Nightfall just sees, uh, that's actually, yeah, that this one is, is doesn't have a huge spirit to it. It's the Bant Spirits. Um, all of these seem to be on the move, like the Mausoleum, uh, Mausoleum Wanderer is on the move on mt joe there's a massive price spike from 10 cents to a dollar uh we have i believe the rattle chains is also on the move on mt joe yep on the move from being worth nothing to 25 cents paper it's it's still you know quite low and then we have let's go back over to selfless spirit selfless spirit is also on the rise on MT Joe and paper t typically follows suit very quickly after this. So I guess for all in all for the, the market Monday, I think these would be my pick. I would definitely come over here and look at this Bant spirits list and try to pick up cards along the lines of these, these cards that exist already. I think that, you know, this might knock off like selfless spirit in the main, uh, cause rattle chains, I think is a little more powerful than selfless spirit because it's modern tends to be a one for one format. Selfless spirit, it has to sack itself rattle chains gets to stick around so i think selfless spirits going to be the the maybe maybe they'll split some of them here uh maybe another two drop makes it so drug school captain can actually be cut down in numbers i don't know here maybe i don't know Reddit could split over uh but i mean this is a, a pretty decent deck if you ever played against Bant spirits it can actually hold its own it has a lot of favorable matchups has a great sideboard option you know having access to both blue and white and it's it has a pretty good punch. Uh, I've actually seen a lot of these Bant Spirit Eldrazi decks too. So they kind of like try to combine the two rather than going the collected company route. And, you know, they, they just put in like Thought Not Seers and, and whatnot. And it's it, it typically does well uh, in the, the modern metagame. 
So the all of these cards are probably just going to go up on hype, even if it doesn't end up being a legit deck. And but I think getting the two the 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 two main uh, spirit cards with it where they go, we have the Supreme Fan- Phantom and the Remorseful Cleric are going to be enough to really you know push the hype and push all those cards up uh, to a pretty decent little buy. So it's probably too late already for MT Joe. Like I said, it just happens so quickly. But if you can get in on some of these these spirit cards from the Shadows of Nistrad, I think that, or even if you go back even f- further, like the Drog School Captains, the guys, I think that they're, they, they it definitely would go up as people actually get the cards to even try these particular decks. So those are my picks for this week. All in all, M19... My my grade from 19 is it's just a utility set. I typically like these sets long term because people open up a few of them. It depends if the draft format's crappy or not, uh, how often this will be uh, opened. And I've, first of all, though, the buy box promo is going to make this uh, this fly off the shelves just because you can sell something for $35. So that's going to inject a lot of cards very, very quickly into the market. And if we could actually see the prices crash faster than normal, because I don't think there's like a Karn or a Teferi out of the set. There might be, but after scouring the list of M19, it just doesn't doesn't seem like, uh, again, it's a utility set. It's not really something that... that uh, I, I saw a clear, clear, just crazy bonkers good card uh, that's going to affect standard, especially that this set is going to be this the set that affects the least because the last set before rotation, we could see some cards after that really start to see a lot of play, but we'll have to keep an eye on that and start looking at all the cards, you know, the decks, the archetypes will exist after Kaladesh and Amiket blocks uh, rotate out. Anyway, hope you enjoyed this incredibly long-winded Market Monday. I'm going to have probably a top 10 list of booms and busts of cards from M19 in the in the following days come out. So be looking forward to that. And yeah, hope you enjoyed this market money. This has been Kevin with RogueDeckBuilder.com. Thanks for watching.